The following message was delivered at Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Bartlesville, Oklahoma on March 17, 2024. The speaker is Mr. Terry Miller, a ruling elder. The message is based upon 1 Peter 3 verses 8 to 20, and it is titled, The Blessing of Living with Christian Suffering. First Peter 3, 8 through 20. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed the spirit to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. This ends the reading of God's word. Please be seated. <coughs> Let us pray. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you this morning. Father, allow me only to say what is true, what is glorifying to you. And may your people accept it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Someone recently told me, <clears throat> in fact last week, that his mother, when she reached an elderly age, found herself often repeating herself and telling the same thing over and over to her children, specifically her son who told me this. And so she developed a statement. I know I've probably already told you this, but I really want you to know it again <clears throat> to save some face of embarrassment because she couldn't remember if she really had said that to that person before. I myself find myself declining in memory more and more as I get older, and I think I'll adopt that into my repertoire too. It uh, does indeed save some embarrassment. The occasion of Peter's writing this epistle was the rage of persecution that these converted Jews were experiencing. Peter is giving instruction to believers here who have been set free from sin and been raised as slaves to righteousness via their union with Christ. Peter, Peter continues through this, book, through this book to restate this purpose in different ways, but not because he has a vanishing memory. <clears throat> he uses this teaching technique, as does Paul, to reinforce things that he has already said especially doctrinal matters that must be pressed home. <clears throat> it is a useful thing for teachers to do. I know that I may have already told you this before, but I really want you to know it today. Peter has concluded the section of this letter which he has encouraged Christians to display their freedom <clears throat> in submission to various authorities in this world as citizens, servants, wives, and husbands. He has encouraged them to bear unjust treatment <clears throat> as part of their calling 
Indeed, <coughs> excuse me. Indeed, to the point of suffering. Now he returns to deal with that suffering in a greater length. He has spoken of this from the beginning of the letter, and he continues on how Christians should bear up under persecution, even to the point of suffering. For God has called us to suffer for his sake and for his kingdom. None of us want to go through suffering. None of us want to go through suffering. Anybody like to go through suffering? I certainly don't. It goes against our nature to suffer and to suffer pain. But this is a vocation that God has called us to. Both Peter and Paul declares that. Peter declares, in essence, take up your Christ and suffer with me. Wouldn't this make a wonderful message in a tract to give to someone? Come to Christ and you will be able to suffer, to suffer with him. Well, <coughs> we usually, <coughs> excuse me. We usually don't present that side in our evangelism. We present the side which is incomparable to that suffering to believers, the wonderful good news of eternal salvation. But God does call us to suffer. <clears throat> I once heard a pastor say, <clears throat> excuse me, I once heard a pastor say that God rapidly advances our sanctification through persecution, and particularly as we suffer in that persecution, and he related how that had happened in his past life, then I said rather naively and stupidly, well, if persecution advances our sanctification, and if sanctification is good for us as Christians, then we should pray for persecution. And he replied with an emphatic, no. In fact, I had to plug my ears to hear that. Well, it seemed logical to me, but like I said, I was naive and not so bright at the time. He was right in that. We shouldn't pray for persecution, but we should pray that God would be with us and that we would be obedient in persecution and suffering, just as Peter is telling us. We should pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We should pray that we would respond rightly as we incur persecution and suffering. So, God gives us consolation for this as we were going through persecution and Peter wants us to know these things. Today we will look at the text under these three heads. Turn away from evil and do good. Secondly, we are blessed as we suffer while doing good. And third, Christ suffered for us to bring us to God. First, turn away from evil and do good. In verse 8, Peter says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Peter emphasizes these graces, that we should have them and that we should walk in them. As we mentioned earlier, we are to be in subjection to various authorities, and this is fleshed out in the fifth commandment. But also, we are to be subject one to another. That also falls under the fifth commandment of dealing with equals. We are to be of one mind. We are to have sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Well, first, Peter describes the clearness of a united mind. We are to have a unity of mind who prayerfully wait for the Lord's return. And we serve one another in brotherly love. We are to prepare our minds for action by setting our hope on Christ. And what are we to be united on? Of course, the scriptures, especially the gospel. What Christ has done for us and his work for us. There are some things that we will never all agree upon that are less essential in the scriptures. There are no people 
two people who totally agree on all of the scriptures, just like there are no two snowflakes that are identical to each other. But Peter is here referring to what Paul says, have the same mind, have the same love, have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The central doctrines about what Christ did and what his he is doing, we are to be of like mind. Well, secondly, he goes on to say, we are to be sympathetic with our brothers. The author of Hebrews says that Christ, our high priest, is sympathetic with all of our weaknesses. Peter has just spoken about the husband's duty toward his wife of being sympathetic toward her. Now he speaks of the sympathy that Christians are to have one to another. We are to rejoice with one another. We are to cry with one another when one member is in pain and mourn with one another. Paul speaks of the body of Christ. When one member suffers, then another member of the body uh, holds that member up, just as if we hurt our finger, another member of our body grabs that finger and holds it up. We are to do that for our brothers in Christ in the church, to be sympathetic. Well, third, Peter mentions brotherly love. Love is specifically Christian. We are the children of the Heavenly Fathers who is the supreme example of love. He has loved us with a love that we cannot totally comprehend to the, de- to the depth of sending His Son to die for us. Well, fourthly, we are to be tender-hearted or compassionate toward one another. Tender-hearted or compassionate. What does it mean to be tender-hearted or compassionate to one another? Well, Paul mentions this in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we are to be tender-hearted toward one another, which involves a humility, which is a segue to the fifth grace. We are to be humble people. God's people should be low and humble. Peter says this is deeper than just the leveling of our pride, but it is to be like Christ who took up the towel and basin and he served the disciples and his ultimate degree of humility was dying for his people. Christian humility will be marked with that same sort of humility one to another and it will be rewarded by God when he returns. Well, verse 9 says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Christians are called to give a blessing in response to reviling that is done toward them. And this is not an easy thing. The natural response to being reviled is to revile in return, but Peter has said previously and elsewhere in the Bible we are to leave room for God's vengeance and his justice but we are to bless our brother when he reviles us and that certainly is difficult to do. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And here Peter Peter is echoing that beatitude. Christians are to not be vindictive. And they are to give a blessing in place of reviling. Well, remember Stephen in the book of Acts. He prayed for those who stoned him just after he issued this prayer, they stoned him to death. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And Stephen here was showing this humility 
of mind and his love for his brothers. And remember, God answered his prayer in the life of Paul. Paul was one who was persecuting Christians. And Paul was standing by as Peter prayed this prayer and no doubt later on remembered that. So we are to bless instead of reviling. And we bless in order to receive a blessing. This can mean that you have been called to bless to the end that you may inherit a blessing. You are called to bless others to the end that you may inherit a blessing. And Peter regularly appeals to what God has done for us in order for us to do the same thing for others. Well, verse 10, in verse 10 and 11, Paul quotes Psalm 34. I had us read Psalm 34. This psalm was often used for young believers who were entering the church. It was used as, if you will, a new membership class psalm. And therefore, I had us read the whole thing, even though Peter only quoted two verses. The first one was, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. If you remember from reading that psalm this morning, the psalmist who was David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord does desire to give life and good days to his people. The the Lord does desire to bless his people with good days and life. And not just eternal life, which he does, but even in this life, God gives us good days. Peter cites this to describe the blessing of life that we are called to those who practice those five graces that we just mentioned, then will be blessed by the Lord, even as the Beatitudes teach us. Verse 11 says, Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And he's quoting verse 14 from Psalm 34. Here, let us do good and not evil. It's easy for us to do evil when we are being persecuted. It's easy for us to take a route of sin when we are under persecution. It's the easy way out. We often take the path of least resistance when we are being persecuted. And Peter here is saying we are not to take the avenue of sin, but we are to do good. It's sandwiched right here in the middle of the verses that he says, by no means should you suffer for doing evil. By no means should you suffer for doing evil. Peter actually says that in chapters 2, 3, and 4 of this epistle. And why does he say that? It's because it is easy to find a way of escape that is not authorized by God. God will always give us a lawful way of escape. So we are to do good in the midst of persecution. We are to seek peace and pursue peace with our brothers. Paul says, uh, to the degree that we are able, we are to be at peace with all men, with all men. Now moving to verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And here we have a, an exhortation, uh, or the, the grounds for the exhortation to do good because the Lord is Focusing on his people. We walk day by day, Coram Deo, 
as Ligonier always expresses in Latin, before the face of God. God's face is on the righteous. It reminds us of the ironic blessing. The light of his countenance is upon us. God's ears are open to our prayers, but his ears are closed to the prayers of the wicked. Indeed, his ears are open to our prayers, and he desires us to come to him in prayer and dependence upon him when we're suffering, suffering persecution. And so this is also a continuation of what is expressed in Psalm 13. 34, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His protection is with us as he gives us good days in the land. This is an example of antithetical parallelism. I had an English teacher in high school who tried to teach me some principles of interpreting poetry. And I recoiled at that. I thought poetry was something that came about as the result of the fall or maybe the Tower of Babel. I couldn't understand poetry. I still struggle in the wisdom literature in the Bible, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I go, why can't man just say it straight? Why does he have to use this parallelism? And we have synonymous parallelism and antithetical parallelism and synthetic parallelism. Well, my English teacher persevered somehow with me and on my tests of English literature and poetry, I said, I have no clue what this guy is saying. If he could only say it straightforwardly, I would understand it. But God uses this poetry, and this is an example of this, which is common in Hebrew poetry. The eyes of God are on the righteous, but they are not on the wicked. That's an example of antithetical parallelism for those of you who are into poetry. If my English teacher were here, he would be proud of me that I said that. He was an elder in RPC in a church that I attended, and I would just tease him by when we visited there saying, I've been studying iambic pentameter and chiasms and all this sort of stuff. And he would say, oh, go home. You never did like that stuff, and I know you still don't. So there you have it. Verse 13 says, Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Who is there to harm you if you suffer for doing good? Paul says it this way, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is there who can, who can condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Who was raised? Who is the right hand of God? And who is interceding for us? When we are under persecution, we should remember that Christ is praying for us. He is interceding for us at the right hand of God, and this should be to our encouragement when we are going through persecution. Well, our second point, we are blessed as we suffer while doing good. We are blessed as we suffer while doing good. Do you realize that suffering is not antithetic to being blessed? Suffering is not antithetical to being blessed, but rather we are blessed as we incur suffering. Even as, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Well, again, as I said, the beatitude that Jesus gave, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus warns his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. He doesn't uh, mince words there. 
He doesn't hide the truth from His disciples. If your Master is persecuted, then you as My disciples are not above your Master. You will also be persecuted. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Christians should not think it strange when persecution comes upon him. We haven't gotten to chapter 4 of 1 Peter yet, but that is the principal thing that Peter is saying in 1 Peter 4. Do not be surprised when you undergo these trials of persecution. Jesus has his disciples to be blessed for suffering righteousness. After all, he has promised them Everything in heaven that is to come, that is a blessing that awaits us for undergoing suffering in this life, and he blesses us even in this life as well with many blessings, as Psalm 34 says. Well, verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Well, this is really repetition for what he has said. If you're reproached, you will be blessed. Blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We have the Holy Spirit who is residing in us, who teaches us how we should respond and shows us how we, we should respond in the midst of suffering and even in having the Holy Spirit within us. That is a blessing to the Christian. Paul said, That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecution and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Paul says, I delight in these things. Do you delight in that? Could you say that with Paul? I delight in all the sufferings and all the blows that I receive from my enemies. I delight in that. Well, that's what Psalm 34 is teaching us. We are to delight in all things in this life because God is leading us. He has given his spirit to us to lead us. And we are to trust in him and delight in him. We are not to fear man, but to fear God. Those are opposites. We cannot fear man and fear God. It is a sign of mistrust if we fear man. Well, in verse 15, Peter continues on to give the antidote to fear. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you, for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Here Peter is quoting Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, honor Christ as Lord in your heart. Some of your translations say sanctify the Lord in your hearts. That word actually means to hallow or to consider holy, which God certainly is. We are to consider and sanctify the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Well, what is the relationship between considering God as holy and being ready to make a defense or an apologetic to everyone who asks you for a defense of your hope in Christ. Well, again, we are not to take a sinful way out. We are to consider the holiness of God and the holiness that he has called us to in order that we should live properly before unbelievers. And then the unbeliever will say to us, you seem to be different. What makes you tick? Why do you act differently than the world? Why else would an unbeliever ask us for a defense for the hope that is within us? He wouldn't ask us that if we went about living a sinful, licentious life, would he? Well, certainly not. It's because 
we are pursuing holiness and we are different, then a, believer, then a non-believer will see that and ask us for the reason for our desire for holiness and our desire to follow Christ. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson made a comment. He said, the early church, its evangelism was actually more in answering questions from unbelievers than it was asking them questions. In our evangelistic methodology, such as EE, we ask evangelistic uh, questions we ask questions, do you have an assurance that you'll go to heaven? And if you do have that assurance, what is the ground of your assurance? But Sinclair Ferguson mentions that it was the unbeliever asking questions of the believer in the early church more than he does today. And that's because the believers in today's age are not unlike the unbeliever so much as they were in the days of persecution that Peter was writing here. We blend in with the world too much. There is too much worldliness in the church so that unbelievers do not ask us what for the hope that is in us. Well, Christians defend their faith by proclaiming the gospel declaring the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter makes it clear that Christians are to be bold in their witness. In hallowing the Lord in their hearts, they are to be ready at all times to confess Christ's name to others. Verse 16 says, Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile you, Revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What does it mean to have a good conscience? Paul often said that I have a clear conscience toward men. We have to have a clear conscience. And this is not speaking about a conscience that has been satisfied by the work of Christ so much, which is part of it. But mostly what Paul is saying here is that our behavior before men should be such that it does not de- uh, betray our profession. It does not betray our profession. We are to keep our conscience clear and before man we should live a life in the pursuit of holiness. That is what he's saying here in having a good conscience because he says, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So in other words, it is our good behavior, our righteous living that gives us that clear conscience before men. Well, what is the conscience? The conscience is a person's inner awareness or moral quality of his or her actions. Well, verse 17 says it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. We've already talked about this in chapter 2. He brings it up again in chapter 3 and he will bring it up again in chapter 4. It's obviously true that if we suffer for doing evil, we deserve that. Our third point is Christ suffered for us to bring us to God. In verse 18, Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This is another statement for our constancy and duty. It's taken from the example of Christ's suffering. And remember in chapter 2, Peter also reminded us that Christ has made an example for us to follow in his footsteps for suffering. But more than that, Peter is pressing forth our union with Christ here, our union with Christ. If Christ has indeed died for us, then we who have died to sin 
and risen again should fall, uh, should suffer for Christ in following in his footsteps. And remember, Peter got his theology or fleshed out the theolo- his theology of union with Christ in Isaiah 53. So this is a major point in Peter's encouragement for us to suffer for Christ because he has suffered in the flesh for us. Uh, the author to the book of Hebrews said, Consider him who endured for who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Well, next in verse 19, we get to a very difficult verse. People have struggled to understand this for many years. Martin Luther himself said, I don't have a clue what this means. And he punted. Uh, Perhaps Augustine hits it closest. He says, because in which... In which he went, that is Jesus, and which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. What Peter is saying here is Christ preached to these companions of Noah in the days of the flood as the ark was being built. As uh, James said in Sunday school, the authorities in the church actually represent Christ. The elders represent Christ and preached. Uh, Noah preached representing Christ to these people about the uh, judgment that was to come. And many of them disregarded it and paid the penalty in the flood. And many of those people, sadly to say, were those who helped Noah to build the ark. Well, I think we should conclude here. There's enough to say about this in the future, and we will put these last three verses together uh, next week or a week after. But what is Peter saying here is that we are not to ignore God's gracious pleas. Today, if you hear his voice, don't be like the people of Noah's day, Don't be stubborn and unbelieving when Noah told them that God was going to destroy the earth in the flood water. And he will liken this to baptism. And we'll see both the judgment and the blessing of baptism. All these in Noah's day were Baptists because they were immersed in the water. And so I leave that line for my Baptist friends. There is a cursing and a blessing that goes with baptism. And we will look more about that. But we are to, in this life as we endure suffering, remember that it is incomparable with the suffering of unbelievers. And I think Peter puts that here for us. As the people of Noah's day who suffered God's wrath, Remember, our suffering is incomparable to the suffering of those who will suffer his wrath, and it is incomparable to the glory of the inheritance that waits believers in heaven. A message to the children, serve your Lord in your youth. Come to him in your youth. We are praying for you that you will. We must heed all the warnings in scripture because of the Great warning that Peter gives in his second chapter of the Lord's final return and judgment. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us to suffering that is not easy to say, but you bless us through suffering. You sanctify us. You refine the gold that you have produced in us through suffering. May we sanctify the Lord as holy in our hearts as we endure suffering. May we find shelter under the wings of our Lord as he protects us, even as Noah and his family were safely brought through the waters of judgment. 
in the ark for Father. You are the ark that protects us. You, Lord Jesus, are the anti-type to that ark as we will soon see. May we flee to you. May we find solace in you while we are going through persecution. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For more sermons like the one you just heard, visit westminsterbartlesville.org or join us at 9.30 in the morning and 5 o'clock in the evening every Lord's Day. We're located on the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We'd be happy to have you.